So uh, please welcome to the stage the director of the film, Kyle Patrick Alvarez. And we also have actors Ezra Miller and Michael Angarano. And unfortunately, Billy Crudup couldn't make it out to the film, but we actually have something better. We have the guy whose character uh, Billy's is based on, Mr. Uh, sorry, Dr. Philip Zimbardo. I love the t-shirt doctor, I gotta say. <laughs> so my first question's for you. Um, I, I, why don't you, I know, uh, just kind of try to sum up exactly what it is you, what we're attempting to do with this experiment, and that way it kind of sums up exactly what the film is about for everyone here. Way back in 1971, uh, in the summer of 71, we tried to do a simple but powerful demonstration of the, of the way in which human nature, human behavior can be distorted, changed, modified by being in new, unusual situations where suddenly somebody gives you total power over other people or somebody takes away all power that you have uh, in your life. And so what we did is we created a mock prison, a simulated American prison in which we filled it with prisons and guards, but unique prisons and guards, normal, healthy, intelligent, young college students from all over the United States, randomly uh, divided by a flip of the coin, have to be guards, have to be prisoners, and we simply observed what happens when you put good people in a bad place. If you fill a prison with good people, the prison should change to be good. The sad conclusion is humanity lost uh, the bad prison situation, the evil won. That should be the tagline for the movie. Yeah. That, Humanity <laughs> lost, evil won. <laughs> I would see that movie. Um, now, this uh, ex uh, experiment was conducted 44 years ago. It's never been brought to the screen in narrative form, correct? No, there's been, uh, there's certainly been films inspired by it. Inspired, there's been yeah. some episodes of TV shows inspired by it, but they've always raised the stakes or kind of uh, transformed the stakes in a way that. It's like oh, it's like almost like you know oh, it, it can't be a film unless life or death is at stake, and that's and also they weren't staying faithful to the experiment. I mean, we rebuilt we built the basement of Stanford. I mean, we stayed as true to it as we could. So it's it's certainly the first accurate. It's the first time that actual experiment has been has been turned into a film. Yeah, this is for for Dr. Philip Zimardo. I, I'm just curious. I mean, like when the script came to you by uh, Tim Talbot, who who can't be here today, I want to know what made you comfortable with this portrayal of that period in your life. I mean, it must have been no doubt hard for you to revisit in a way. What made you, you know, wholly confident in, in his vision for, for the way to bring this to the screen? Well, I, I actually had revisited shortly before. Uh, in, in 2008, uh, we were stunned at the release of a dozen images of American soldiers, military prison guards in a place called Iraq Prison Abu Ghraib, humiliating, degrading, torturing, abusing prisoners in their charge that they were supposed to be defending. The parallels between what was happening there and the prison study were palpable, meaning the guards there, as in the guards of the prison study, put bags over prisoners' heads, stripped them naked, humiliated them. And so many people asked me to comment on it. Uh, is this the work of a few bad apples? And I began to say, my belief was that American soldiers are good apples and somebody put them in a really bad barrel as I had done to the good apples I put in my bad barrel. And the other issue is who created that bad barrel? And that's the system, that's the Bush administration, Cheney, Rumsfeld, and, and George the man, and the military. And so, so, so they, they, are the, they are the guilty ones, not poor Chip Frederick who's at the end of the, the food chain. And so I wrote, I wrote up my, uh, my uh, Abu Ghraib statement. And while I was doing it, I said, I have to revisit what happened in my study 30 years ago. And so I watched the 12 hours of videos. I made typescripts of those 12 hours. And then Tim Talbot, who had just been hired to, to do the script, I, kept, I sent him every chapter as I was writing it. And then we would talk about it. You know, can you put this in? Does this make sense? Is it too much? And so I was involved in all of the dialogue between prisoners and guards, which is totally faithful in the movie. And then I was a consultant on the movie. Uh, 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 Kyle and I exchange, exchange uh, talk. Uh, and essentially, 
gave almost everything my okay, say, yeah, this is accurate, this is not psychologically valid, you should n not include this piece or that piece. So the movie is a faithful reconstruct, recreation of the essential features of the study. I'd say at least 90% is right on. And no matter, you know, what um, the script looks like, you know, a director imprints his or her vision onto the final product. I want to know what you made of it when you finally saw it at Sundance. No, I was stunned. I saw it the first time at Sun Sundance, and I was stunned by the visual beauty of it. I mean, the whole package. The music is wonderful. It's, it's, it's never intruding, but it's always, it's always moving, moving the things along. Uh, the directing... Um, it's clear Kyle is an actor's director, and the actors can tell you, I mean, not being an act, you know, that it's, he, it's clear he got the most out of every act of every scene. And because he was also the editor, it was obvious to me that while he's shooting, he's imagining, you know, what are the different angles? Can I shoot from overhead? Can I shoot from the side? What is going to be in slow motion? So, so I could appreciate as an average film goer, something special is, something special is happening in, in this movie. And it's, it's his editing, uh, his editing, his, his directing, and then the brilliant acting of, of the cast, which was really stunning. Kyle, this marks one hell of a leap for you. I mean, COG is a, is a dark comedy inspired by the work of David Sedaris. This is not, not so comedic. It's a lot yeah. darker in tone. Um, what appealed to you about this project? How did you come on board? Yeah, I don't, you know, my fr the first two movies are, I guess, like character, you know, they're character dramedies and comedies. And, but I, I, don't, I grew up sort of follow, like really getting involved in loving film in the 90s when that kind of, when like character dramedy indie films were, when it's Alexander Payne and Todd Salons and these guys were really doing definitive work. And I love that. And my first films are an extension of that. But I also grew up on like Hitchcock and thrillers and suspense films and a lot of 70s cinema. And, I'd always wanted to do something like that too. I kind of believe that, I mean, I love directors whose identities are in each film, but I really love the directors like Ang Lee who the movie becomes, their work becomes an extension of what, the, what you need for the story. And, um, and so when I read this, I felt like I understood the challenge. I, I felt like it's not a common feeling to read something and then you go, oh, okay, I know what's gonna make this hard to do, but I also know what I need to do to solve those problems. How are you gonna shoot a whole movie in a hallway? How are, what does this cast need to look like? What are the fundamentals of telling this? You know, I love that the film only covered those six days. You weren't learning anybody anybody's backstories, you weren't learning about their personal lives. There was a lot of decisions already made that were fundamentally ones I would like to. So it was just about trying to deliver through on that on that promise of what's going to make the movie hopefully unique and special. This is to you and to the, the two actors we have. Uh, did the intensity of the project intimidate either one of you or did that you just embrace that from the get-go? I think there was an inherent danger that we were all aware of in terms of simulating a simulation uh, and maybe falling into that M.C. Escher painting <laughs> and then being stuck there. Uh, and um, I think to Kyle's credit, um, he did a lot of work. I think we were all vetted. I think yeah. there were some background checks. <laughs> we did. We, I didn't hire, I didn't cast people I didn't have for the most part, especially the, the guys who are going to be the everyone that everyone's gonna kind of be looking to for their behavior you know i i said there's so many talented young actors and um there's a drive i think people have in their early 20s or even younger to prove themselves which i really or to show what they can do and i love that but it comes with a flip side too which is that some people feel like they need to own that in a way that i think can be actually kind of socially dangerous on a shoot like this like the people who need to like suffer for the film and what's great is i think we brought brought a bunch of people together who knew that they had to put themselves to a place to perform when the camera was rolling. But when we weren't rolling, it was like actually a pretty enjoyable, it was hard to like get a, everyone to sort of quiet down because people there were, were having were a, lot a good of, time. Yeah. There were a lot of dick jokes on set. <laughs> a, lot, a, lot a lot of, of dick, dick jokes, jokes, a lot yeah. of fart jokes. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Terrible, yeah. terrible humor managed to alleviate horrible, much worse tension that was, that we were picking up in takes. Exactly, yeah. But no, yeah, it actually, the, the, the thing that I think we're all grateful for is that the group of people who came together was actually able to create a really happy, fun, creatively fertile environment. Uh, and then we were able to plunge, I think, deeper than we would have been able to if we were all in our attempted actual pain bodies, <laughs> you know, and, and we're able to like really 
I guess I'd say like jam. You know, we were able to jam. Yeah, there's a lot to be said about acting. There's the extension of acting. There's the emotional extension of it. And then there's the actual craft of it, which is, by that I mean an actor who understands how to access those emotions and then channel them through the character as opposed to the actor. I'm not saying this is better. It's just a, it, for a film like this needed to work this way. The actor who access is, you know, what I just said, access it and channels it as opposed to the actor who just experiences it. And then that just is what they're getting. And it's basically like, roll the camera now because I have this, you know. Instead, this was a much more controlled. And when you're working with people like these two and Billy and people who, it's, it's in their blood and they, under, they fundamentally understand what their job is to do. It's, it's so much more joyful because the camera stops. So you can kind of, you can actually say, hey, hey, look, that angle, we got to move it a little bit, or when you got a little too loud on that part, and you can kind of dissect what's happening on a technical level, as opposed to someone, you know, you go to an actor and be like, so the camera is moving, and you're moving a little too fast, and be like, where is there a camera? You know, there's no camera. I am this person. This is real. It's just a, it's a little bit more confrontational. We were shooting so quickly, and there were so many people in every scene that it was just nice that we could enjoy being with each other in the process. You just brought up confrontation, so let's uh, watch a first scene from the film that's quite uh, confrontational. Heavy shit. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, Michael, your character's a bit of a dick in the movie. <laughs> let's discuss that. He's kind of a horrible person, a little, you know, redeemable by the end when you kind of, you know, see the real him come out because he's playing a role for most of the film. How did you rationalize his actions, you know, as a human being in order to, to play this guy? Well, to me, I never, I never did think of him um, in any kind of blanket way as, as a good or bad guy. I, and, you know, he, uh, based on Dr. Zimbardo's vetting process, I, you know, he was a, a very, you know, well-educated smart, you know, 20-something-year-old guy. The truth was he was actually an aspiring actor who had just watched Cool Hand Luke before he did the Stanford Prison Experiment. And so all he did that was completely unique and separate from the rest of the other guys in the experiment was that he chose to play a role. And he full-heartedly embraced the role he played and was incredibly convicted. And I mean, I, I'm sure it's even more fascinating to watch, you know, the six hours of footage of him doing an accent and, and you know, physically embodying somebody that he wasn't. And so when you watch the interviews of him, you know, after, after the experiment, um, you know, two months later, kind of like a debriefing that's also at the end of the movie, he, he speaks of it like he, he really didn't realize the effect that he was having on these on these guys, or the emotional effect that he was having on these people, and um, he was able to completely emotionally detach himself from his behavior, which you know is a remarkable trait in the real world. I feel like that would be what a sociopath is, but in the present in the prison in experiment, in our world, we call yeah. it actors. Yeah, uh, hello. <laughs> in, in the experiment, he just instigated results, and you know, to like a really remarkable effect. Um, you, you said that, you know, the, the spirit on set, the, the atmosphere was a jovial one, but did, you know, on any days on set, I'm guessing the, sh uh, the shoot was a short one? Yeah, it was a really, really short shoot, so I feel like... Meaning okay. what? It, it was like 23 days, 23 days, which is like, in a lot of ways, I mean, yeah, I say it's a short shoot and people do 23 days, and like, yeah, that's like every indie movie, but... And that's, I've had less, I've had a little bit more time on movies before, but in this case, I, what was different was we had 25 leads, Almost everyone working every day. As you saw in the film, almost everyone wearing period clothes, period wigs, facial hair, everything. And, uh, and it was a 130-page script. You know, you're talking about a script that's about 30 pages longer than your normal average 20-day indie film. And so there was all of these elements at play. And you can't, these aren't, you know, in the past, as a director, I've always tried to be a little... Um, occasionally present in terms of when you're watching the film, but usually absent, right? You went naturalism. And this movie, if you had made it with naturalism, it, would have, it wouldn't have worked. There's something I always, I, I tried to remind myself to never forget that the situation is absurd in of itself. You know, he says, well, he just watched Cool Hand Luke and you hear it, you're like, even now, three years later, I'm like, it's still kind of insane to me that it happened and the way it happened. Um, and also, I, and I sort of reminded everybody, we were like, we can never forget that this is a bunch of kids wearing potato sacks on their heads, and I mean, on their bodies, and stocking caps on their heads, and these guys wearing these glasses, there is an absurdity, there's an inherent 
humor, and I don't mean humor, ha-ha humor, I mean the uh, darkly comic sense of what really happened here. And, um, and I think holding on to that was sort of the key to making a movie that was challenging, but hopefully not miserable to sit through. You know, there's a, it's a really weird, if you make a movie that's trying to indulge in that kind of um, pathos, it becomes just straight uh, uh, sadism, yeah. you know, as opposed to entertainment. Yeah, I, I want to ask a question of the, of the actors. Uh, we had considered another director whose idea was to create in the making of the movie real antagonism between prisoners and guards. They were going to shoot in Regina, Canada in the winter, freezing, and they were going to have the prisoners live in the worst motel in town and the guards live in the best. Prisoners have barely edible food, guards, and, and then, you know, and, and throughout, the pri like when they would count, the counts would go on for hours. So he really wanted the prisoners and guards to hate each other on the set. And what he was literally hoping for is to recreate some of the emotional breakdowns of the prison in reality. And he said, you know, we will have a clinical psychologist available to help them when they broke down. Oh, sure. It sounds like a documentary. Like, <laughs> paramedics in a sports game. Yeah, so, so, yeah um, someone will have a breakdown, and then we'll put them back together and we'll get them back up. It's fine. No, there's no problem. So, so, but, It'll but, break down, and you just talk okay. them through it. But again, <laughs> when he hired you, you wouldn't know that. But now, oh, no, 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 <laughs> no. But I'm saying now, imagine, imagine, you, you're now doing oh, I'm this. Doing it, yeah. What, how, what would you do? I mean, you're stuck in fucking Canada. You know, the guards are now abusing you actually, physically. On, say they wanted it to go offset as well as onset. I mean, what would probably you have a nervous breakdown. You'd have the nervous breakdown. <laughs> but would you then, quit? Then would the you? onset psychologist would be obviously unable to pull you back. I would call my agent. I'd call my agent, then I'd call my, first Rob would probably call my mom, and my mom would be like, yo, call your agent. I don't like this one bit. I don't like the sound of this film project at all. Well, of course, we take away your and cell phone. And my mom and he my would agent. Have, he would have taken away your cell phone. <laughs> cell phone gone. But I think they didn't the, have I, cell phones in 1971. Goodbye. To me, You're what's right. interesting to, point. to discuss about that, though, is I feel or to anyone out there who's like a, a looking to be a director or is a director there's you hear all these stories right the filmmakers I've loved my whole life were those kind of manipulators you're talking about like Hitchcock was that way Kubrick was that way I mean we know this yeah but you know these guys that yeah I admire so much and I I don't have that in me like I'm not I don't want to be confrontational I mean maybe that might make me not the best you know I mean you directing you do have to embrace confrontation and it is challenging but at the same time I don't want to instigate that in actors I mean acting is it's I, I, I think you I think a lot of uh, there is this sort of history of great directors almost hate actors you know and I and I, I don't I, I love that what they do so much because I could never do it that I want to honor that instead. And, and, but in a weird way, it took, it took me a while to get over that feeling because I thought, well, all the guys I admire so much do that. But you just sort of pave your own way. And, and, and some actors do love that. Some actors love being put in the grind and they want that. But for me, my feeling is if the actor wants that, then you give it to them. And I've done that. I've worked with actors where you've got to be like, you know, you go to them and you're gonna be like, you're gonna be alone forever, and everyone hates you. That's and a you're classic. Miserable. That's yeah, no, a I mean, classic. I, I, an actor one time was like, I needed a little bit of help, and it was a crying. So he was playing a very lonely guy, and I was just like, you're never gonna be, you're never gonna wake up in bed next to a woman again. All those kind of things. And he was like, thank you so much. And then like went and did a beautiful job. But he wanted that from me, so I gave that. But in a film with 25 people, and every scene is a crowd scene, and this is what I said to these guys when we would talk before. I'd be like, we don't have the room or the time or the space for that, you know. So we have to meet in the. Everyone kind of has to meet in the middle of their process. And, and the good thing is, is that people, I think generally as a whole, the vibe of the set, the, I, I really think these two were looked up to for that. You know, I think people looked, I don't think you guys were aware, yeah, be, and the other, the other actors did, yeah, that, you know, you look to the people who in a way, Ezra was playing the leader of the prisoners and he was playing leader of the guards. And so I think that the kind of behavior, professional behavior starts at the top in a lot of ways. And in this case, Ezra and Michael, yeah, well, okay. Starts with me, and then you guys. No, but I think you guys were leaders in your own right because I do think that behavior came from you guys. So I think the the positivity from the set trickled down on a hierarchical way that was actually made it made it really enjoyable, even when we were shooting the really miserable stuff. Yeah. Well, we're talking so much about the ensemble aspect of this film, and as a filmmaker, I just want to know how you day to day kind of wrangled the cast. I mean, how did you figure out who needed attention? who, you know, was well on their way to... It's, it's weird. I told everyone ahead of time, I said, you can't judge how much you're doing or not doing or how much you're getting from me. Like, just trust 
more so because I'm used to my first two films it's like one guy in every frame of the movie so I'm like let's get lunch let's get to know each other let me be there with you I wouldn't have been able to be there if I tried to do that on this film I think I would have led people down the wrong path because they'd be looking for me more than I'd be able to give when you're shooting 15 pages a day and so actually I just sort of said look you guys are going to be you're responsible for yourself more you know uh, treat each other well be respect if someone doesn't want to talk between takes that's okay let them be that way you know and a lot of ways just had to we were moving so fast that I don't think there was any I think the good thing about shooting this movie so quickly was that there wasn't time for insecurity to seep in. You know, insecurity between our relationships. But also I had to take a little bit of a step further away. I had to tell myself, as close as I like to get with the actors on this film, not for, I had to be a little bit further removed, being like, you know, I'll get to be, we'll get to hang out and get to know each other after we finish shooting. I mean, usually when you wrap an actor, you kind of walk with them back to their trailer and you, you know, you say, thank you for all your hard work. We would wrap an actor and be like, it's great seeing you, bye. Like, we gotta go <laughs> yeah, on. Yeah. Because it was just like, we're, I mean, uh, yeah, we finished shooting, like Ezra's last scene was like his, one of the heaviest and scenes for him in the movie. Yeah, yeah, and it was literally yeah, like, bye, okay, bye, bye, bye. Okay. <laughs> okay. We still have eight pages to shoot yeah, we're today. shooting <laughs> another 14 <laughs> scenes, so. Yeah, yeah, I mean, and, but in a weird way, everyone, everyone had that experience, so no one was, and the thing I said, though, to everyone is, even though there's 25 people, and some people have more screen time, or some people are the instigators of the plot, I tried to treat the ensemble as each person was as important, that you could conceivably have the character trained on, like, Jesse, who plays the guy asking for the cigarette, you could tell the whole movie just about him if you needed to, we just, this, our story was angled in in a certain way, and, um, and that comes from casting talented people in all of the parts, and letting them do work and have freedom. And it, it was really fun. I love doing an ensemble thing. Yeah. Now I'm like, oh God, I have to go back to normal, normal five people movie. You don't have to, you don't <laughs> have to. Um, let's watch one more clip from the film before we're getting to audience questions. <laughs> Sinister point to leave let's off. Let's bring there. him to the old yeah. class. Yeah, 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 so. yeah. Anything could happen. With uh, uh, how many takes? Yeah. With Ezra, we, you know, th with, with, yeah, that scene, we shot Ezra separately. Initially, because he was a totally, we were literally, you were in a closet. And, um, and that's a, a, a version of, you can listen to that clip online of that, the real guy saying, saying those words, saying, I'm burning up and all that. You know, it's that sp a, a panic. And I love, what I love what Ezra did was you were listening to it at the time and had it in your, and had it in your ears, but you weren't recreating it. You weren't copying it or mimicking it. You were just trying to like absorb what his panic was. And then it kind of came out in a really similar fashion. And then we shot Michael's stuff later in the day, but you were still, you know, banging on the walls for his yeah, sake. Yeah. And then, but I, but I love what you did. What you chose to do was just like, it's actually one of the only times you actually actively get angry earlier on in the film where, but it seems more you're like a dad that's, you're just sort of like, cause even every, there's so many scenes in the film where like, yeah. you're losing it. You're like at 11 and Michael's just like, <laughs> I just like <laughs> over it, and it's a great it's a great dynamic that wasn't scripted he's like, or this because he's so boring. Yeah, it's just like yeah, oh like, this so this guy, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. and it creates a but it's great. Those are the dynamics you don't really discover. The best feeling is when an actor surprises you or does something better than you imagined it being. Or or we talked a lot about this scene as and I did because there is an iconography to it to me or, or one we were trying to build of this this moment because the sound is so definitive of the experiment. Um, and then when you see it happen, and it's and this was like you're like this is going to be this moment, and then it's as good and better than you thought, and it's just a great feeling. And then the composer did. It was the first time I ever worked with a composer, and um, and he did such good work. And it, I don't know. It comes to you're really happy when those beats all kind of come together. And then we cut to Billy Crudup doing something great that we shot a month later. You know, so it was, it was such a weird. It's such a weird thing when you watch those things back play back after you've made the film and say like, oh yeah, you feel, you feel good about it, which is rare. Normally I'm like, I hate everything I've done. You know? <laughs> so the couple of times you, you feel good, you kind of go, okay, yeah, you acknowledge it for your own sake. I have one last question before we get into audience questions. I moderated a few of these and you know, usually when we show a scene, the actors cower in fright because they can't watch themselves on screen, but neither of you did. And those scenes are pretty friggin' intense. You did a little okay. cowering. But um, do you like watching yourself? Do you hate watching yourself? What do you make of yourself on screen when you have to watch yourself? To be honest, I usually watch something in all, uh, in all complete honesty to, to see how I failed <laughs> and to see really what I, what I could do better if I were to do it again. It's almost like you know, watching a replay of a, of a game if you're an athlete. You, you want to see... You want to see, I, I at least want to understand why I made certain decisions and why I didn't make, you know, better decisions. Yeah. Uh, and why did I do that? Yeah, essentially. <laughs> uh, yeah. But especially when it's something like this, which, you know, we shot so quickly, and especially the way in which Kyle shot it, um, you know, there were, there was so much coverage that he shot. Um, 
So I, I didn't really have a definitive understanding of what the actual scene was going to look like. You know, what, I sometimes. <laughs> but I mean, it. So to watch, especially something like this, the final product, y you're you're really surprised, not by how good it is because we all trusted Kyle, but I, I genuinely, I, I didn't physically geographically know how the scene was going to be shot. And so, you know, I've only watched it once, but watching those scenes, those... And also, they're, the way in which we shot s stuff, we shot, you know, sometimes 10-minute, 15-minute, 20-minute long takes in which you kind of, like, see red and, and don't really remember anything that you were doing. Like, I had no recollection of banging that nightstick on the table. I have no idea what he was talking about when he said that. Um, so, I mean, it's, inter it's interesting to watch, but... You know, you kind of get sick of it after a while. Yeah. I think that wasn't like yeah. that's not a scripted moment when you went like that. You know, it wasn't anything. It was just like in the moment. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I feel like I'm getting a little better at disassociating over time to be able to like actually engage in the film in some sort of way instead of just like being constantly self-critical. Yeah. Uh, because that's obviously not necessarily fun to do especially when you're like at a celebration of the film and it's an event and you're like surrounded by all these people and you're like eh. mm. <laughs> eh. you know it's, i think know. there's a lot of power in an actor who can watch themselves back not out of vanity or not out of like oh dude i look good but just being there's a there's a whole technical side right it's not it's not even not to say theater isn't technical but filmmaking is so much about the camera is rolling where is the camera how do i play against the camera the interesting thing working with, for the first time working with guys who have been working since they were kids since they were really young is such a more heightened awareness of how the camera works and by that i mean you know he had like ty who was 17 now 18 but he's been do, you know shooting stuff with Lube Emmanuel Lube since he was like six years old. So he would be like, so what's the, he wouldn't be like, where are you cutting me off? He'd be like, what's the lens on the camera? And you'd be like, oh, it's a 20 millimeter. He'd be like, okay, well I know if it's, he would just know like his marks based on that. And there's something about the technicality of it that I think does help sometimes. And I've worked with actors who don't even want to see what they look like on the camera at all. Um, I've worked with actors who like need to see too much. But there's a good, I don't know, for actors I feel like there is a good thing of what you're saying, disassociating a little bit and being able to at least be aware of it as opposed to wanting to live in sort of a bubble where that stuff doesn't exist. I think heavy vanity is the way forward. I think <laughs> instead of being self-critical, we should just be going like, hmm, I look good. <laughs> That's what, you know. Brett, Brett, when we were shooting the slow motion stuff, I remember there's this, there's this, we did a Brett's coverage and where he's like moving in slow motion, getting scared, and we watched it back. He was like, "Yeah, yeah." I look while we were doing playback. He's like, "Cause you don't obviously can't record." You know, he was like, "I look amazing in slow motion." He's like, "This is great," and I love, I love that. It was great. So with that we're going to open it up to the audience. If you have a question, please raise your hand and uh, could you say who, your name so we know mic. something about you? Uh, my name is David. Um, I want to know from a director and actor's point of view, you guys talked about it briefly earlier about getting into the characters. What other methods did you guys have to take in to get to get into your characters and as a director just, you know, showing what happened throughout the experiment? Uh, yeah, for me, I, I handed over to them the materials that existed, you know, about this experiment. There's so much video and dialogue and interviews. And so I handed that stuff over to them. Yeah, which was which was critical stuff, you know. And then, uh, yeah, I don't know what are the modes oh, of so preparation. I mean, I, I read some of the work of this guy, which is very helpful. The Lucifer effect was really informative. Um, there's there's so there was so much material um, about the experiment anyway, and yeah. it, it was kind of interesting um, approaching it because you know you could read. And you could watch, and you could hear, and you, you know, you, so there was a lot of research and work that you, all you had to do was kind of tap into it. But also, I think it was a really interesting thing that, um, you know, appropriately so, the, they, the, all, the, all the guys in the film, um, they're, they're fictionalized versions of, of, of the real guys. They're, you know, their names weren't lent to the film, but as, as, as a choice, not because they didn't lend their names to the film. And so it's not, like, it's not like we were doing what Billy was doing, Billy Crudup, who actually was playing Dr. Zimbardo. Um, you know, we, we didn't look exactly like our, the guys we were playing or portraying. So there were more creative liberties that we could take as far as that goes. But there wasn't like a rigid structure. But also, I thought it was really interesting that, you know, you never really know anything about these guys other than that they participated in the experiment. So for me, 
all all that I needed to know was that he was prisoner eight six one two and that I was a guard. You know, I, Zevi, I studied the uh, Stanford Prison Experiment in college a lot, so it's a huge honor to be here. Um, c looking back over forty years later, can you speak to the mental process you went through in kind of seeing what was happening on screen and uh, your reactions to it? Oh, while I was watching. Uh, it was very unreal because um, uh, this movie has been in process for 35 years. There's been many scripts, many directors, many actors, uh, and they all pooped out uh, until um, Brent Emery uh, approached me, I guess about 13 years ago, saying he definitely wanted to make this movie and I should just stick with him to get, he'll get producers, which he did. Um, uh, a good small team headed by Lizzie Freeman and others uh, and he would get so and then he signed Tim Talbot so we started working together like eight years ago and the movie was started the production was like three years ago we, we started I got involved three years ago and then we did pre-production in August uh, 2014 and then shot it September October 2014 yeah, so it was really intense so it, it was both wonderful for me to finally see this this thing on the screen, because I thought I would die before it ever, it ever materialized. Uh, and then I was just amazed at uh, the faithful reproduction, that is, scene after scene. The, the strangest thing was to hear somebody say, hey, Dr. Zimbardo, and I go, yes. <laughs> uh, uh, and, but then also the suffering. I mean, you know, as it goes on, and the guards are abusing the prisoners more and more, and I'm saying, no physical punishment. Hello, there's something called psychological punishment you should know about, and that's what, so I never stopped that. So I felt guilty in the real life for allowing it to go on too long, and I felt guilt, re I recreated that guilt in watching the movie, saying, come on, guy, end the study, blow the whistle. Um, and, but but it, was, it was a very moving experience for me. Uh, so, so the bottom line is, uh, the movie is disturbing. I mean, if you watch the movie and not disturb, you didn't see this movie. You went into the wrong, <laughs> you went into the wrong uh, uh, metrion. Um, but, but we really hope that the movie will, that you transform that dis disturbing feeling into reflection and say, what kind of guard would I have been? What kind of prisoner? Would I have ended that study early? You know, uh, what is the theme here? Isn't it every day, in everyday life about abuse of power by parents, by teachers, by prison authorities, you know, by policemen, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, and can I do anything as an ordinary person to change bad situations? And what can I do as an individual to promote everyday heroism in, in, in the people I meet? I just thought of, when you said that, I thought of uh, when Castle, you know, would release his B horror movies, it'd always be like, you have to sign your, sign your death certificate before going into the film because it'll scare you to death. Yeah, Being like, yeah. the, our gimmick would be like, we'll have shrinks there to, you know, we'll have psychologists there to yeah, help watch our movie. And then, and then the, and the and advertisement would just be a shot of your face saying, if you, if you watch this movie and didn't get disturbed, you didn't watch this movie. <laughs> <laughs> it would be like the, can you survive it? You went in the wrong door. <laughs> Some more questions, yeah. I'm really struck by how the guys immediately took to their roles. My guys are those uh, guys. No, I'm talking about the original my guys. experiment. Okay, sure, yeah. Right. And my question is how soon after you finished the experiment, I don't know everything about it, yeah. did they sort of go back to themselves? And did they, how did they reflect on their behavior? during the experiment. Right. I mean, how did that, right. did you note how it affected them? And I'm, I'm just curious sure. about that. You need to buy a ticket on Friday, yeah. July 17th. I'm kidding. No. <laughs> no, I mean, unfortunately, we don't show in the movie, after the powerful end scene, <clears throat> what happened next. What happened next is, I met with all the prisoners for several hours while the guards were changing out of the unit. I met with all the guards, and then we brought the prisoners and guards together. So we had many hours of what's called debriefing, which I explicitly said, this is a time of moral re-education. Everybody here did bad shit, starting with me. There were some guards, as you know, did very bad things, and there were good guards, but the good guards never interfered, never limited, never challenged their buddies, so they are in complicity. Some prisoners broke down, and we really feel bad for you. We didn't understand why you broke down, because we chose you, because you're normal and healthy, but 
The prisoners didn't break down, never gave them emotional support, never told their buddies, I'm sorry. You know, could have prevented it. Uh, once the prison started breaking down, it was almost like a leper. The others literally avoided him. And when the prisoner left, no one ever mentioned, like they vanished, like they di died. So, so essentially I was able to say, we all did bad things, but you know what? You were chosen because you're normal, healthy, on all these dimensions, and now <coughs> what you're gonna do is you're gonna hang up the uniform, step out of your costume, you're gonna step out of the basement, meaning you're gonna step out of, out of the set, and you're gonna go back to your real life, just as actors do. So literally, I made, I made that parallel then, and I know that there's none of the, I respect the terrible feelings that you have, the anger, the dis depression, the guilt. Uh, but you're gonna leave that in this basement when you hang up your uniform, you know, when you leave the set. So it really was almost as if I'm saying to the actors, you guys did really bad shit, you really did bad shit, but now you take off the costume, you leave the set, and you go back to your life. And our ev we followed them up. I mean, they came back two weeks later, they came back a month later. Some of them, um, th their two characters, uh, I was on That's Impossible 2020, 60 <laughs> Minutes, you know, so for many years after, and there was no evidence of any negative lasting effects. There's no question people suffered during that set, but I think it was really because they were in fact very normal. There's no psychopaths, there's no, there's no, no negativity that, that, that uh, this experience fed into. And then I made it explicit to say, leave the bad shit here, go back to your normal life, and, and most of them did. A couple of people became prison psychologists, am yeah. I correct? Yeah, I mean, a lot of good stuff came, I mean, a whole, whole chapter in the book, so buy the looser effect, second-hand copy, only $2.99, uh, two <laughs> Amazon. <laughs> Amazon. Uh, <laughs> that is his character, who broke down in 36 hours, it changed his whole life. He became a clinical psychologist, got a degree at Berkeley, and spent his whole life, since 1971, as a prison psychologist in the San Francisco County Jail. Not only that, he says, in, in the, the movie we made, the documentary, his whole life is raising the dignity of prisoners whose dignity is destroyed as a prisoner and suppressing the sadism of guards who, who have, the pa have that in their role. So, so, so if nothing else, 8612, who became Doug Corpy, he's a, a, was a kid in San Francisco, has been doing good for prisoners and guards for, 30, for 40 years. So if there's only one thing in the study, I mean, who ever heard of that as a consequence of being in an experiment? Uh. Hello. Hi, you, you I'm are? Heather. Heather. Nice to meet you both. I'm big fans of both of your work um, and following your careers for a while. And um, so my question is, well, as he said that I learned about this experiment in college as well in psychology. So how did you go into this project knowing how big it was, how historical it was, and how did you prepare for something this extreme? How did I prepare for something this extreme? It's been a lifelong process. <laughs> Got arrested a couple times. No, no, no. Um, yeah, no, that's a good question. How did we prepare? I mean, again, I think that like, it was a combination of, uh, do you mean like, do you mean like, I'm just gonna ask a clarifying question. Do you mean like how did we prepare our psycho-emotional selves in order to deal with it? Yeah, well yeah, it's a, I think that that's kind of interesting because it's the same almost as asking the question, which I think you spend a lot of time thinking about now with Hero Camp and all these ideas is like, how do we prepare ourselves our true selves, our selves that are not gonna fall apart when our circumstances that we prop ourselves up on fall apart. How do we prepare our internal selves to be ready to handle a situation like that in real life? And I think like Dr. Zimbardo just said, it's like a, a daily little practice. I don't know what it is for you, I know what it is for me is like, you know, a, li a little daily practice. I've never practice. had to deal with anything that extreme. Me neither, m m me neither, not, not in the real deal. But I hope that when those times come, which I think that they will for all of us at various times, probably more than once, that will be the people who exist, who do step up and call out injustice and act. Yeah, but there, there, you're right, there has to be like a certain amount of 
inward reflection before you go into something like this. At least, at least you know, my, my whole thing was I, I hope that what Dr. Zimbardo's experiment, you know, the way that it's resonated through, you know, for the last 44 years and, and, and the, the way that you felt when you watched the documentary and, and the way that you felt when you, when, when you read the script, it, it really is pretty upsetting stuff. And it really is, um, you know, like the equivalent, I feel like, would be, um, you know, like playing a, a rapist or playing, you know, a murderer. These aren't things that you really understand. So I guess all you can really do all you can really do is trust the people around you and, you know, trust the material that, that, that you have in front of you and, and to, you know, make, you know, well-educated guesses as to what it would, what it would be like. And, and never forget that, like, filmmaking is fun. I mean, it can be hellish and challenging, and, but, you know, you, I think acting is the same way and that was something that these guys did and some of the other guys in the film did really well, which was still, like, you walk on set and you're like, oh yeah, we're on a set. This is going to be fun today. You know, that kind of vibe. Yeah, put you... the chain on my... Yeah, 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 I got the chain on. Let's do it. Yeah, yeah. Which, you know. During the actual experiment, you were almost part of it, like prison superintendent. Right. How did that affect the outcome of the experiment? Uh, it, it made it go four days longer than it should have. Um, again, I, I've said this many times. Um, I should have been only the principal investigator and not the prison superintendent. The big mistake was not to imagine what it takes to do an experiment that goes 24 hours a day, night and day, for two weeks. That's the plan. With me, an undergraduate who's 18 years old and two graduate students who are in early 20s. That's around the clock. In the middle of the study, the chief graduate student, Craig Haney, has to leave for an emergency. That means it's me and two kids doing an experiment 24 hours a day. What does that mean? It means somebody's uh, you, uh, making the v TV camera, somebody's getting food, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, uh, somebody's taking kids to the uh, student health when they break down, somebody's dealing with parents who are upset at visiting times twice, somebody's dealing with the pro board hearing, somebody's dealing with, with the um, prison chaplain, somebody's dealing with public, so shit is happening all around, and I'm not sleeping at all. I'm sleeping in a bed in my office in the middle of the night. They come down and say, oh my God, somebody's breaking down. And so we were overwhelmed. It was stupid to think you could do an experiment with even four people. So we didn't have a big enough team. We didn't have more money. I should have, I should have, I should have paid for more graduate students to work with me. So we didn't have enough money. We were overstressed. There was more bad stuff happening than we could imagine. And again, rumors of escape. Uh, we're going to move all our prisoners back to the real jail. I mean, it was just, it was so ambitious. It was, thinking back, I can't imagine how stupid I was not to anticipate that we couldn't do it with, with that, that many people. And so f falling into the role of prison superintendent simply meant that everything for me was um, part of an agenda. I, I literally had a printout. 8 o'clock breakfast, 10 o'clock uh, visiting day, 12 o'clock lunch, uh, at pro board hearings, 10 o'clock toilet run. So at 10 o'clock was the last time pri guard prisoners, guards would take prisoners to a real toilet. After that, they had to shit and defecate in a bucket in a cell. And this was the last time the night shift guards could humiliate the prisoners, put bags over their heads, chain them together, make them like a, a prison chain gang, yell, curse, scream. And I looked at, and what did I see? A check mark, 10 o'clock toilet run, rather than human suffering. Uh, and essentially, I had lost compassion and sympathy for the prisoners. My focus was only on the guards. Are they doing their job? Yes. They're not, they're not no physical t punishment. But, but I'm ignoring what I'm trained to see, psychological abuse. And essentially, uh, I had lost all compassion for the prisoners. Co so the prisoner breaks down. What was my main concern? Repl get him to student health and replace him. Let's find a replace. So, so in that role, Prisons, I made really bad decisions. I never should have done that. I should have had somebody else do that. And if I had done that, I would have ended the study after the second prisoner broke down. We proved our point. You know, prison, people are breaking down in the experiment. You know, who ever heard of that? The first one, when 8612 broke down, I really thought he was faking. I thought he was faking it, you know, very dramatically so. <clears throat> and then the rumor was <clears throat> he was going to bring in his, he and his buddies were going to come in and liberate the prison, you know, break down the prison and, and free all the prisoners. And we believed it. 
what was amazing is I study rumor transmission instead of saying, wow, this is really interesting. Why don't we <laughs> study, you know, it's, I believed it. And we were going to move our prisoners to the real county jail. I, I, I went there. there I, sp I, I spoke to the prison <laughs> sergeant. I said, look, we, we got this attempted prison break. It's going to be violence. I want to move my prison. And he said, sure. He must have thought this fucking guy is crazy, a lunatic, because <laughs> he knew it was an exit. And then he called. I, I, so we have the prisoners with bags over their heads ready to move down to the jail. And he calls and says, no, we can't do it because uh, the uh, city manager said we'll be, have a tax liability if anybody gets hurt. I start screaming at him. What kind of, what kind of cooperation is this between our... <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the guy said, hey, lunatic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, uh, this question's from Michael. Your name? I'm sorry. Oh, my name is Tony. Tony. Uh, at any point, did you feel guilty about having to treat your fellow actors like that? And uh, my yeah, other... <laughs> and my other question afterwards is, since you're in Sky High and you're going to play The Flash, was there like some nerdy talk in between takes? About superhero superhero talk? Yeah. yeah. Just yeah. what it's like Cyc to be a superhero. Cyclops was around too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, and yeah, Doc, right, Doc, yeah. Doctor Manhattan was Doc, behind the yeah, scenes yeah, there. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Uh, what's what's Nick's character's name in Sky High? He was there too. Um, he he just glowed. I forgot. Oh yeah, the glow. Yeah, exactly. The glowing kid. He just glowed. <laughs> um, did I feel guilty about treating the other actors bad? No. <laughs> Michael yeah, would also, you'd also became like another AD. So when it, like the AD would be like, hey, you guys, we, you know, we got, we got the camera up and we're going. Yeah. You'd be like, we got the camera up, we're going. You no, would like to like, repeat it all. All right, guys, we got the camera up now. We're going to go ahead. Ah, <laughs> camera's rolling now. <laughs> there were funny things that, you know, we do these lineups in the movie where the prisoners have to line up and, and, and you know, recite their numbers out loud. And in the script, it's a long sequence where he makes them go back and forth. And that was one of those instances where Kyle let the camera roll for way too long. <laughs> you the know. editor and me hated the director and me when I was like <laughs> yeah, trying to yeah, sort yeah. through 30 minute long takes. Literally like, oh. 30 minute long takes where we're doing these real lineups and it was so interesting because a lot of like how I was saying before where there are things I don't even remember. There's so there's a, a lot of moments in the movie that I have no idea happened because I, I just know I just remember that they kept forgetting their numbers and I got really pissed. <laughs> And I said, start the fuck over, because you're, we're, I could be here all day. So you, you better get it right. We had the other scene, too, that was like that. There's a scene where you make Ezra make his bed. And, we, and I remember one time we were like running up to time, and I was, you were like, well, I have to make the bed. It was this sort of great thing where we have literally like 30 minutes. <laughs> Nobody realized of, that he had Ezra to make like the bed. Lifting a bed and tucking the sheets in. But, it, but it, w when we cut it together, what was great was that it informed then when we would see your face. But it was so funny. I remember there was these long, long moments where me and the script supervisor were like, oh, my God, the bed's actually being made. It was, it was really Also, it, it informed it my bed making technique. <laughs> it was beautiful. For years beautiful. to come, I'm sure. <laughs> And were there were there superhero camaraderie ch talks? Death. Yes. All the time. And also, I mean, this comes in, it plays into something nice thematically, which is that Dr. Zimbardo runs, bam, he runs hero training, and it's about, you know, stepping up in day-to-day -day -day situations. <laughs> and Yeah, and then and the fact that, obviously, the superhero mythology is like a, a very thin veil for just talking about something truer about humans than what we talk about when we talk about nonfiction. You know what I mean? So it's like, and, and yeah, and yeah do, we're talking, always talking superhero yeah, And shit. do visit the heroic, heroicimaginationproject.org. Uh, we have lots of exercises. People want to volunteer, get involved. Uh, uh, you can sign up with us. We're in San Francisco, actually. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much, everyone. And the film Thank comes you. out this Friday. Check it out.